thank you, Michael, and thank you uh, for inviting me here. I was just saying to my colleagues, public speaking is one of those things that I just never habituate to. So uh, if nothing else, me standing up here is proof that no matter how neurotic and shy you are, it is still possible to do these kind of things. So I will, I will continue, or I will begin, uh, by talking about some of the work that I do in clinic. I'm going to focus today on one case. I'm going to focus on one person. And we are going to call her Anne. And I will give a fiver to anyone after in the break who can actually tell me where that picture and where that pseudonym is from. That's your pop quiz for today. And Anne is a pseudonym. Uh, she's a conglomeration of various people that I've seen in my clinical work. All the details are real, but they've just come from different people. And she's in her early 30s, uh, like probably quite a lot of you, could be uh, fairly soon. Uh, she's working in the NHS. She's a single mother, uh, and like a lot of single mothers, she's getting on with it, she's coping, she's got a lot to do. She's got a very busy job, as you all know, or as I'm sure some of you know. The NHS is not the kindest place to work these days. There's quite a lot of pressure. There's increasing pressure to do more with less and to accomplish targets. Anybody who's in academia uh, also probably knows it's not the kindest environment to be at the moment. So I think we can probably empathise with, with Anne to some degree. So single mother, she, she gets quite a lot of help from her sister and She's a self-described stoic coper. Uh, she's someone who, from a very early age, because she pretty much had to look after her mother rather than the other way around, has just got on with stuff. One of these people who just gets on with life. So, yeah, she said from, from 17, she, and she's now, yeah, she's now in her early 30s, and she said, from 17, I'd, I've just had to get on with it. That's, that's just what you do with life. You just, you cope, you get on with it. And she said something in the midst of therapy, uh, in the midst of the, the treatment uh, that she got, that uh, looking back, I can't recall a time when I was happy. And she didn't mean that in any kind of maudlin way. It was just a factual observation. It's just happiness had not been on her agenda. It was just, it was success, it was achievement, it was uh, achieving the next goal. And again... Even from the, the smattering of conversation I heard in the green room, or whatever we call it, where we, we gather before these talks, that's quite a common trait uh, amongst us lot. We just kind of get on with stuff. We're quite achievement orientated, and that indeed was, uh, was her orientation. So I saw Anne, she, she kind of crossed the, the clinical line, as it were, and I sometimes think we're all pretty close to crossing the clinical line, uh, but she crossed my particular clinical line. Uh, w her main presentation was fatigue, uh, but also symptoms of autonomic dysregulation. I don't know how much you guys know about that. I'll leave you to Google it. Uh, I will just say it basically means that you're, you're switching between being on, uh, heart rate up, breathing, and being off, relaxation, parasympathetic activity was really out of whack. She was having lot of breathlessness. She, when she stood up, her heart rate would go up. It wouldn't stop. She would sometimes faint. She was passing out a lot. She was knackered. She was having a lot of physical pain, a lot of joint pain. Her sleep was completely out of whack. So she was presenting primarily with physical symptoms uh, rather than uh, mental health symptoms, which is how she came to see me. So I work in a fatigue clinic, a transdiagnostic fatigue clinic. So if you imagine the model of a pain clinic where whatever the cause of your pain, uh, be it cancer, be it chronic pain, uh, whatever the reason, you would come to a pain clinic. We set up a similar clinic in Newcastle where we see people with post-cancer fatigue, people with liver disease, people with chronic pain, and any condition where fatigue is a principal or, or large complaint, you can be referred to us. So uh, we won an award, our clinic. It's a very nice clinic to work in and uh, multidisciplinary and I'm the health psychologist on the team there. And so that's how Anne came to see us. And so how can psychology help Anne? Because if you, if you look at her presentation, it's like I said, it was primarily physical symptoms. Uh, it was primarily uh, embodied, as, as we're increasingly saying. 
I think one of the reasons is, uh, or one of the things that we can do as psychologists is slightly broaden our scope and remember that uh, all distress, whatever its uh, form, is ultimately embodied. It shows up in your physiological systems, it shows up in the way your body functions. And fatigue is indeed a transdiagnostic thing. We're beginning to realise, in fact, I think as psychologists, we're beginning to think much more outside of diagnosis and we're beginning to think about processes that run transdiagnostically. I certainly know that the BPS are beginning to head that way ideologically and see things transdiagnostically. And I think fatigue is a really interesting transdiagnostic phenomenon. Ask anyone who's in any kind of distress. I mean, who, who, anybody in the audience a bit tired? Anybody a bit worn out? Uh, yeah, you know, everybody is a little worn out. Life is tiring and being successful is tiring and being a single mother is tiring. And if you add a few of those things together, it gets more tiring. And, uh, and it's biopsychosocial. So uh, we work with an occupational therapist, with a consultant, with a physiotherapist and me. So one of the things that people really like about our clinic, and we can say this uh, not, not just out of vanity, uh, we've actually asked people, we've done a survey, one of the things they really like about our clinic is that they do get a holistic treatment. The, the body, mind, medicine, physiology, social stuff that we address or we try to, uh, because we're very oversubscribed, we try and address all of that. So how do we begin to understand this? And, and more uh, uh, pertinently, how did Anne begin to understand this? Because I, I, as I hope to show you, I think a lot of the work that I, I do in particular in the clinic is narrative. It's actually helping people make sense of their condition. Uh, because particularly if you've got one of these conditions, say like uh, Erlos-Danlos syndrome, POTS, chronic fatigue syndrome, IBS, that, that are, are disputed or a lot of people don't believe in, a lot of the work that you've got to do is narrative. You've actually got to come up with a story uh, for other people. So how do we begin to go about helping Anne understand what happened to her? Well, let me tell you what happened. Uh, and I think I said, yeah, we're going to start off with the engineers and the pilots. Uh, so how did Anne become a case I was talking, I, I did a s similar version of this talk to a, a, a lay audience and there was a pilot in the audience and we were talking about how, as you will see, partly what tipped Anne in, into caseness, as, as it were, what got her through the clinical door, uh, was an increasing series of life events that meant she was just tipping over to the point where she wasn't coping. And what the pilot said is when we're training in the cockpit to deal with emergencies, we talk about that in terms of the bucket of capacity. So there, there's a certain point uh, after which you can deal with maybe two things going wrong in the cockpit, maybe three or four, but then your bucket of capacity kind of falls off a cliff, which is a bit of a mixed metaphor, but I think you know what I mean. That, it, that suddenly your capacity to cope, if there's too many things to cope with at once, it just falls it just plummets. And so the, the, the pilots know this. This is actually what they're trained to cope with, that we can only deal with so many things going on at once. So if, uh, what's the name of that film? Spinal Tap. You know when they turn the dial up to 11 and the, 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 the volume, that, that's the kind of mixing desk we're thinking of. So if you've just got one event that's turned up to 11, that's probably culpable with. But if multiple things begin to go wrong at once, which is what was essentially happening to Anne, the way the engineers talk about this is also, uh, I, I just like this quote because I like the West Wing, a meltdown isn't when one thing goes wrong, it's when 12 things go wrong. This is uh, on the West Wing talking about what makes for a, a nuclear incident. It's not one thing, it's 12 things. So I was trying to illustrate this and uh, forgive my very primitive drawing skills, uh, but I did it without the use of any graphic software. This is just old school pen and pencil. So. We don't have one of those clicker pointy things, do we? So if you look at the, the top left, the one with the green, what the engineers say is that when you have got a system, say like a car or a stereo or a telephone or any system, it's got a, a space of comfortable functioning. So if your system, if your stereo, if your car is kind of driving along normally, or if your body and your being and your life is kind of in the comfortable space, then you're in the middle. You're the green dot on the top left. 
But then imagine that one thing goes wrong. And with Anne, it was her child's husband who suddenly came back on the scene and started suing for custody and became very unpleasant to her. So one thing began to go wrong. And what the engineers say is when one thing goes wrong, you become what they call in an edge case. One parameter is beginning to go over to the edge of comfortable functioning. But when two things begin to go wrong, you're beginning to move into the corner of your comfortable space. You're moving out of comfortable space. So then she got a new boss. And any of you who work in any kind of institution know that your boss is very much like the parent in a family. They set the tone of your working life in a way that can be really quite unpleasant. Anybody here worked for a very unpleasant boss who's <coughs> caused them enormous amounts of stress? Yeah, it shows up physiologically, doesn't it? And she was talking about uh, her colleagues who were coming into work. One was crying in the car park before they got through the door. Another one was actually being sick, on a, physically vomiting on a regular basis because their work life was so unpleasant, made particularly more unpleasant by the boss. So, yeah, she was beginning to move from edge to corner, and then the, the, the triple whammy was her sister dying. So the sister who had been helping her with the childcare, who'd been there since she was young, uh, died. So uh, that's how Anne became a case. And the other thing, I, I, I think the thing is psychologists, and if you take one message away from today, it's we need to be careful that our attribution of caseness is not idiocentric. What, what do I mean by that? I'm saying we need to not blame Anne. We need to not say it's because she was a perfectionist or because she pushed herself too hard. She was, and she did, she was a stoic coper because that's how she coped from when she was 17. But in fact, it was the circumstances she was faced with meeting her basic strategy of you just get on with it, that's what you do. So that's what she continued to do. Things went wrong, and so she just upped her game. And she upped her game to the point where she just one day physically collapsed. She could literally not get out of bed, just her whole body Shut down, bless her. It was difficult. Uh, if you want to think about this in terms of health psychology terms, second thing you should actually take away from today is allostasis. Do people know about allostasis? Quick show of hands. Yeah, it, it's a very undersold concept in psychology. Homeostasis is the work that you need to do to stay the same. So if you think of what you're all doing now in terms of maintaining your body temperature, your uprightness, your uh, alertness, such as it is to this talk post lunch, which is always a really difficult slot, you're doing homeostasis. But if you're having to adjust to a new set point, uh, a, a new set of demands, that's called allostasis. So the, the basic model of stress, or a really useful model of stress in how psychology, is called allostatic load. It's the consequences of having to do too much adjustment and for, to do that for too long. And physiologically, that wears the highlight of you. So if you look at the, the top two diagrams, that's basically showing the, the graph of adjustment. It means you never quite adjust. You're always having to adjust. So physiologically, you're always on. And we know now that this is a problem. And again, not just psychologically, physiologically. There's an increasing... Uh, amount of research that shows in inflammatory conditions, in pain conditions, in fatigue conditions, in sleep disorders, in anxiety disorders, in generalised anxiety, markers of allostasis, markers of dysregulation uh, of the systems that you need to ad adjust to these circumstances are implicated uh, quite strongly in illness. So, so where is Anne? The, the reason I'm talking about this particular case is because we are pretty lucky in a weird way. We saw Anne when she was three months in uh, to, to this crisis. In the clinic I work with, uh, and this is a whole other research project that I, that, that I could spend a lot of time talking about. In the clinic I work with, sometimes we're the first clinic that has believed in people and given them a diagnosis after 15 years of trying to get a diagnosis. And if you think of Anne's case at 15 years as opposed to at three months, if you think of anything, if you think of anxiety at 15 years as opposed to three months, or depression at 15 years as opposed to three months, it's a different entity. So relatively speaking, Anne was lucky to find 
help that she found helpful uh, very quickly. A lot of people with these kind of presentations really don't. Uh, it's, it's very much uh, a snakes and ladders game when you've got these kind of when you present with physical symptoms. So, like I said, a lot of the work that we did with Anne was narrative. We we tried to help her make sense of what was going on, and. Like Michael said, part of the, the shtick of my book is not draw, drawing just in psychology, but drawing in other disciplines that I think can help us as psychologists uh, make, sense of, uh, make sense of making sense, as it were, make sense of helping people tell the stories about their illness. Because if you think about <coughs> how the sociologists would talk about this kind of uh, onset of illness, they would call it biographical disruption. And again, this is probably a concept we can all relate to. At some point in our life, we get derailed from the path that we're on. And how you make a story about that and how you cope with that is a major part of the work. So, lovely book, which anybody interested in this topic, I really recommend have a look at. Uh, and it's called The Wounded Sto Storyteller by Arthur Frank. And he basically says that, that part of the work of being ill is coming up with a story, not just for yourself, but for other people. So, for instance, uh, we did uh, work with uh, children who had chronic fatigue, who were going back to school, some of them after two, three years off school. And part of the work they had to do was what story were, were they going to tell people when they got back? Because it's not the kind of thing that people understand. So what he says is that if you get a cold, like I've got now, so forgive me if I sound a bit blocked up, but if you've got a cold and then presumably you'll get over it in two or three days, it's a there and back again. It's a restitution narrative. Things are okay, you get a bit of a blip, you, you get the cold, you get over it, you're back to normal. So again, it's kind of homeostatic narrative. But if you've got a chronic illness, uh, part of the research I do is with head and neck cancer survivors, and we're often, uh, and literally survivors, their cancer's gone, but, you know, 5, 10, 20 years down the line, they're left, with, uh, they're left with an inability to eat uh, food in a normal way, which uh, sounds like a small thing. It's an enormous thing, but that's a whole other research story. But they're never going to get back to normal. They're never going to get back to where they were pre-cancer, even though the cancer's gone. So often, if you look at the, the, the discourse around cancer, it's about beating it, it's about living with it, it's about overcoming it. You need a quest narrative. It needs to be a kind of heroic story about how you've come to live with and adjust to cancer. So it's what we would call, call kind of successful allostasis. You've adjusted to a new set point. The most debilitating one, and this is where Anne was at the beginning, is when you can't make any sense of what's going on with you. So if you've been to a doctor like she was initially, who's just told you why well, the symptoms are probably just all in your head, you're probably just a bit stressed. That doesn't help. That doesn't help you make sense of, of, of your symptoms. And there's really good research to show that people who cannot come up with a story about why they're feeling what they're feeling are much more distressed by what they're feeling. <coughs> so maybe we could call it failed allostasis. You're not able to adjust to your new set, set point because you do, don't actually know what's happening. One of the things I really like about movie structures is they, they kind of they, they encapsulate the basic narrative structure that anybody uh, will encounter if they're telling a story about themselves, if they're reading a story. And so if you imagine act one of any movie, it's like Anne's life before anything went wrong. You kind of see the normal setups, things are going on, and then in movie parlance, the thing happens, the inciting incident. The alien arrives, the, the, the diagnosis of cancer comes along, depending on the genre of the movie. You meet the, the love of your life, but it's problematic. You know they're not really going to get together till the end of the movie. But something comes along that ends normal. That means you're going to have to start adjusting. And what do we want to see when we go to the movies? We want to see Act 2. We want to see people adjusting. We want to see adversity, problem solving, difficulty, crisis. It's entertaining as spectacle, but to actually live through it is difficult. And it's not until you've made sense of it, you've successfully solved the problem, that you get to Act 3. And why is that difficult? Because for most of us, like Anne, we live routine lives. Uh, habit has become a, a big field of study in health psychology. Health psychologists, psychology in general, seems to have woken up 
in the last decade or so to the fact that a lot of our lives are lived on automatic. And what makes change so difficult is that the old routines no longer work, that you have to suddenly start adjusting to a whole new bunch of demands. You have to think again for the first time in a long time. You're going to feel a whole bunch of feelings, and you're going to have to do, a, you're going to have to, uh, do stuff. It's going to be effortful adjusting to change. Like in the second act of most movies, it's going to be something to do, it's going to be something to watch, it's going to be something to feel. Uh, Ron Borland is a health psychologist who says that you can compare automaticity to the, uh, a rider and an elephant. Most of our lives, we just the elephant of automaticity just takes us along. Uh, just occasionally, we might need to steer it one way or the other, but the automatic does most of the work for us. But transitions, that's often why people come into the clinic. It's why Anne came into the clinic. It's often where people break. That's the book I'm working on at the moment uh, called How We Break. And transitions, can, they, they can be interesting and fruitful times. Uh, a quote I particularly like from Samuel Beckett. He talks about life transitions as perilous zones in the life of the individual, dangerous, precarious, painful, mysterious, and fertile, when for a moment the boredom of living is replaced by the suffering of being. You can always trust old Sam for a laugh, uh, but I think he makes the point well. Daniel Dennett, who's a, a neuro philosopher, neuropsychologist, somewhere in between the two, talks about free will in a similar way. This is from his book, uh, Freedom Evolves, and he says, actually what makes life uh, both challenging and interesting is when two, uh, you, a new world encroaches upon yours, when you meet something different. And again, you can see what happened to Anne. It's very much that act of encroachment, new stuff that she's having to deal with. Or uh, old stuff leaving. Uh, another quote from the West Wing, just because I like it, but also because it's apt for Anne. The most costly disruptions always happen when something we took for granted stops working for a moment. In her case, it was her sister who was suddenly no longer there. It wasn't until she was gone she realised how much she'd relied on her. So, Anne. Anne saw us in the middle of Act 2. She was still trying to adjust. Her body was all over the place. Her sympathetic nervous system was kind of either completely on or completely off. She was either completely wired or fainting. She was either in bed or running around. She was just uh, in a really difficult state. In terms of the, the kind of three basic systems, she was cognitively preoccupied. She was uh, emotionally uh, anxious, not so much depressed, uh, but certainly troubled. And physiologically, uh, she was <coughs> just all over the place. People familiar with the compassion focused therapy framework? Again, quick show of hands. Yeah, I would really recommend it, particularly for the people in clinics. Uh, I find it a really useful uh, framework because the, the, the essential message of compassion focused therapy is when you're going through a crisis, be kind to yourself. Much more difficult to do, uh, as you probably know, the, the, than it is to say. But what I really like about the framework is it allows you to talk about the physiology as well as the, the kindness. And it really helped Anne make a lot of sense of her symptom. This was the basic framework we used to help her make sense. And again, I'm not going to go into it in too much detail, but uh, Paul Gilbert, the, the kind of the daddy of compassion focused therapists, posits there are three basic mechanisms. Two of them are on. So the stuff that gets you through your careers, that gets you passing your exams, that gets you through that job interview, or that gets you doing stuff that you enjoy, dopamine approach is one. The other on mechanism, which is much less pleasant, is the threat mechanism, the flight or fight. We know that HPA axis is implicated in both. So there's two kinds of on, and often the worst stress happens when those two become synergistically involved. So Anne's job had become both the stuff that she needed to really do to get challenged, and a major source of threat in her life, and then other stuff piled on. So she could see, and the research bears this out, that that kind of constant onness was partly why her body was no longer able to switch off, or her ability to switch off, which is this very underused uh, drive, which is partly parasympathetic, maybe some oxytocin, but whatever it is that helps you switch off. 
And a lot of the people I see in the fatigue clinic, they're not good at that bit. In fact, one of the, 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 the clients I used this diagram with, when, when we drew it out, she burst into tears and said, I just can't do that bottom one. I just cannot switch off. And so, as a framework, like I said, it really helps do the, phys the physiological narrative work and the life narrative work. It really helped and make a lot of sense of what was going on with her. So, let's see, how are we doing for time? If I really get 77 slides, that sounds unlikely. Uh, let's hope that's not true. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not going to go on for, uh, only going to go on for about another 10 minutes. So, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'm... I'm aware of kind of over bombarding you with, with, with uh, concepts, uh, but I think my, my general point is, as psychologists, we should look outside of our silo. Uh, sociologists have really interesting things to say about chronic illness and transition that really helps in the clinic, and uh, liminality is a concept that, again, I think has been very useful for me in my clinical work. Liminality is when uh, th the way Oh, it's there, it's there in the title. Where you're no longer what you were, which, think about Anne, she's no longer in the life she was, but you're not yet what you're going to be. So they use the concept often in terms of the transition from, uh, from youth to adulthood, uh, from singleness to marriage. So ethnographers love liminality, because that's when you really see the use of ritual, the use of narrative, the use of transitional uh, props and... Yeah, they're really, again, it goes back to that Samuel Beckett thing, they're both fertile and dangerous times. So that's another concept we can throw into the pot that can help us understand. Um, and the mystics, the, the, the mystic literature, the wisdom literature, Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, they talk a lot about this. They talk a lot about what happens when you're on the path, where you're moving away from what you used to be to what you are. The, the, the way that uh, the early 20th century uh, theosophist Dion Fortune talks about it, is on the desert path your soul comes face to face with its own shadow, its dweller on the threshold. You can see that's also very Jungian language as in Carl Jung, that notion that when you're going through difficult times you're facing up to the most difficult stuff in your life and that's part of the work that you have to do. Uh, and I know that kind of way of talking it is probably quite unfashionable in psychology, but again, it's part of the work that Anne had to do, was actually facing some of the most difficult stuff in her life. And it came back to this, her saying, I cannot recall a time when I was happy. And that became the work. It actually became about her basically reorientating her values. So what helped Anne? Uh, the kindness stuff really helped her re-evaluating her position in the system. One of the things that, uh, because I work a lot with people who are uh, off work or who are trying to return to work or who are trying to get benefits, the uh, benefit system is so unkind to people at the moment, makes so many people iller. Another rant, but let's stick to the topic. With Anne, uh, she was thinking about going back to work, but what she found is that the, the, this institution that she had poured all her life and her energy into, when she was down and out, it just turned on her. It did not support her, it did not help her, and actually, paradoxically, that was really helpful for her. Because she saw, actually, why am I caring so much about this institution that does not give a damn about me? Which is why we put up the fuse metaphor. She thought she was a really shiny star, irreplaceable within the institution. Not in a narcissistic way, she just valued her role. And what she saw was that once that fuse had burnt out, all the work cared about is where is the next fuse coming from? Who is the next person? If it's not you, how can we replace your place in the system? That really helped her. Uh, she also started to reevaluate uh, a, a life that had been based on achievement and thought a lot more about kindness, closeness, rest, recuperation, recovery, looking after herself, nurturing herself. So that shift from achievement to kindness was really, really crucial. And, yeah, I, again, it's very difficult not to get political when, when you do this kind of work because th this is some of the stuff that we're currently... So that... that Bottom left, 
uh, which is one of the... It's called the Continuous Improvement Cycle. I think it's one of the initiatives that the NHS is currently subject to. Sounds like something from North Korea, but it's not that different. It's this idea that you need to be... Continu you can't rest, you can't stop. You need to continually be doing more and doing more with less, and that you're responsible for it. Two very senior clinicians I knew who were feeling the pressure of this within the NHS. They reported it to their manager, and their manager offered them resilience training and mindfulness. <laughs> of course he did. Let's not change the system. Let's just kind of put some armour on you. Uh, there's some really interesting critical psychology critiques of mindfulness and resilience. And again, that would be a lecture in itself. But I really like this notion. Uh, let me read it out to you. The resilient subject is a subject which must permanently struggle to accommodate itself to the world. Think of that permanent adjustment, that allostasis we were talking about, and not a subject which can conceive of changing the world, its structure and conditions of possibility. It's not only politically catastrophic, it's fundamentally nihilistic. So I think we need to be really aware of when we're telling people to go off and do mindfulness and resilience, should we be addressing the social circumstances in which their lives and their distress is embedded. Maybe you can do both, there's no harm in doing both, but just focusing on the individual, I think, can be really uh, not a good thing. So, what did Anne change? Uh, she made sense of her story, uh, she switched from solely caring for others to looking after herself, and she left her job, and that made an enormous difference. Again, I'm not saying that's a solution for everyone, but it helped her. She, d she did a very sensible transition out of her job, but she transitioned out of the job. And let me see, there's just one more slide that I, I want to put in, which is this, it's the narrative, it's the importance of narrative, uh, that, uh, and this is a, a new book that's just come out, which is saying as scientists, we need to not just be putting facts together, we need to be helping to tell stories, and we need to help our patients tell stories. That is my story for today, thank you for listening.